Okay. Good. Then, hi and welcome to my talk, Pushing Documentation. I hope everyone had a good lunch break and uh, now I try to be interesting enough so you don't fall asleep. <laughs> um, okay, let's jump in. Why this talk? I think, uh, and I make constantly the experience that documentation is undervalued. Most of the times, not when documentation is needed, but all the other times. So, in the time where you get the task, oh my god, I have to do documentation. When someone is uh, juggling the priorities and dealing with budgets, oh, documentation, ah, we can do that later in case we have time. And uh, So, most of the times it, it gets pushed away. So. But, we need it. That's, that's the other opposite. So why why is that? So why is it so easily pushed away? Documentation or creating documentation is to most of us just boring. It's not like we don't get the feedback we get from coding. It's it's um, it takes more effort and by this is by boring and more effort it, it makes it tedious. Then we try to avoid it and so, so documentation is the unloved part of, of building systems, right? And after all, it's most of the times an alien activity because uh, we need to switch our tooling, we need to switch to Word or to some other systems and it's completely different in what we are used from, from our daily work and way we work and how we love it and the tools we, we love like version control where we can see difference and what changed and easily jump around and then having Word as a one big software with incredibly set of features, no one, no, no one of us most of the times really knows. We just somehow push the documentation in and then don't bug me with that. So this is really then not contributing to making us more, more feeling good creating documentation. And this talk is then, why this talk? about to change it. Because we actually found a way where it's more, more livable to do documentation and it's more easy to integrate in our developer process. Um, but first, let's talk about why we need that documentation. So we at Caracun, we like to work with agile methods, which is Scrum, which is Kanban, and um, some of the others. and when talking about Agile, of course, the Agile Manifesto is omnipresent. And the Agile Manifesto states working software over comprehensive documentation. What most people read out of this is working software over documentation. And yes, that's really, it's uh, like, it's easy to take it that way then because then we have a reason not to do documentation. But that's clearly a misunderstanding. Um, what they meant is actually it's working software over comprehensive documentation. We need both. We need the software and we need the documentation. We should not value documentation higher than the software because in the end the software is our product, not the documentation, but we do need documentation. So we really should remind ourselves that it's still needed. It just should not be too much. And this is also what I will try to talk about, um, how much is the right size of documentation or the right amount. Um, another aspect of why we need documentation is to consider all the people who are involved and what they do about our software we create. They need to communicate about. The business needs to communicate to everyone what they actually need, what would help them, what would uh, be a benefit to um, make sustainable business. Uh, the people creating it, the developers core or solution developers, need to communicate what they understood and what they actually implemented. The so support needs to know what the software does, so it, they actually can give support. And in the end, and last but not least, the ops need to know how to handle the software so it can actually be run and uh, be in place, so it delivers the value that the business wants to have from it. And all these communication, if we would just be done by talking, it would be too, too um, fast gun, and we have to be repeated again and again. And this is why we need to put it into a permanent documentation so it can be shared and it can be built upon 
and it can be uh, used actually and maybe minimizes some of the repetitive need of communication that the picture implies here. Um, if we also look a little bit further, um, we have a gap in the lifetime of a software project. So we have a software team working together to create the software we want to document, we need to document, and these are in average together um, like three years. So then they need to do other projects, there the team gets torn apart, and but the software is there, it's created, the system is running, it's hopefully delivering some value. And this, the time the system is running after go live has an average of 13 years. So there's a gap of 10 years if we just do the math. And um, of course, the future me getting back after two years other project and then somebody asked to change about my uh, former project or the, my colleague who needs to change some money. He, we are really in demand for documentation we can use to handle our software. So these are the reasons why I think this is a good topic to talk about. So when we now consider, okay, we need documentation, but how do we do it in a good way? So we push it, like the title said, and it does not hurt me anymore, but I just get it done and somehow. So first we need to think about how and what. And a good first step into documentation is to think about who is the one using my documentation. Like the picture with the many arrows we saw, some of these might be the users of my documentation, and thinking about them really helps to get started with the documentation. And really then to streamline my documentation to that, to that users helps me to not be overwhelmed when I start to document and I sit in front of a blank page, where should I start? And then really thinking about, okay, who will be using it and what are the questions and he might be? Even if it's uh, technical documentation, it might be myself. Consider, okay, three years from now, what might be my first question if I open this source base again? Um, yeah, this, with this in mind, it's just getting started and improved. This is, we, sometimes one get, gets blocked by seeing the blank screen. And so a good first step is with this addressee, uh, with this user in mind, um, create an outline. And then having an outline, you know already where you want to head with your documentation. And then filling in that outline is just filling the gaps. And then it's again from the agile methods, it's again um, improve in iterations again. But also it's, um, or that what I said is might already imply it, documentation is not an end in itself. We document for others. This is what it helps, helps a lot to, to motivate ourselves to do the documentation. We do not need to do the documentation because it's a task and because we need documentation somehow, so because someone else needs that documentation. And what we need to bring or to remind us for is that the feedback of the documentation, this lies somewhere in the future and might never reach us because we are not available for that feedback then. But somebody will thank us if we invest some, some effort in that documentation. This is completely different from coding and delivering a feature next week and where the, the PO then says, yeah, exactly, that's how I specified it like I like it. That feedback is with documentation a long, a much longer time away. Um, okay, this is all the, a lot about documentation. Now, we have that point that a different world, these documentation tools which are out there. And um, this is, should be changed because we don't want to deal with we have our we have certain practices in software development which we find really useful and we have established. So appropriate tooling for that is um, is something that we found really to make it much more easy to deal with documentation. And um, a suggestion as tooling is ASCII Doctor um, as a format. Uh, ASCII Doctor itself is first of all um, a processor for ASCII Doc, which is then the plain text format. 
Um, so you write, similar to Markdown, so you write just in a text file, and that just text files makes it easy to integrate to many tools and platforms. So for ASCII-Doc, there are plugins for basically all IDEs, most, um, most commonly used IntelliJ and Visual Studio Code. And um, also, you are then not bound to one output format. On the other hand, you can render ASCII-Doc basically to everything. So you can generate HTML, PDF, eBooks, and then DocBook, which is a generic format to literally generate everything. And um, in a, uh, some slides later, I also show you how this output to everything can easily, easily be used to, to integrate with your surroundings. Um, ASCII doc is a plain text format, and that makes it possible for us um, to use the diff view of Git and to, to easily track changes, and also to maybe combine it with our source base and integrate it with our merge request. So we can include it to our definition of done. So the so the reviewer of my change, of my implemented feature, can also request, okay, and the documentation has to be in there, and I want to see it in that merge request. And these diff views makes it a lot easier to handle and make sure the documentation reflects the state of our system and not having then also the remark in the, mark, in the merge request, oh, yes, and the Word document also got updated or I will do it tomorrow or something, which is disconnected and it needs to be integrated. So we really can keep and to exchanges. And alongside with this diff view, of course, then comes um, our version history and our um, Git strategy, how we deal with merge requests, how we do version management. And this version management is also pretty important for documentation because whoever the user is, if it's a developer or if it's a, a business user, um, it's frustrating to have documentation that does not meet the system. So I really need to keep track changes for the versions so that I can tell the user, okay, please use the documentation for that version. And I can tell you where to find that right, right documentation. Um, yeah, so, but I don't like just slides. So I want to show you a bit what ASCII Doctor is about. Now I switch this one. This one. Okay. So this is the uh, IntelliJ view. Is it readable? I can zoom in a bit more. And what I have opened here, you this is just uh, the plain text syntax, which um, which is pretty much straightforward. I think most of you have already seen Markdown. ASCII doc is like Markdown, but it's more consistent. This is um, this is what I found from using it. It's, uh, it has fewer quirks and it, it does not need those flavors Markdown needs to, uh, to provide a richer feature set. And um, this is actually what you see here is the uh, ASCII doc um, plugin for IntelliJ in place. So you get instantly a preview of, the doc of what you typed and what you formatted. So this is really useful and um, it makes, makes sense to use. Um, you see that here are certain special features like these curly braces you, you get icons for and get then um, these outlines. You have sections, of course. Um, you can include source codes, like I did here. And you can also add markers inside the source code and explain these this bits and pieces then. This makes it useful for... Uh, source code documentation and 
yeah so but then down here you um what also is a feature from from ascii doc um it can be it has extensions to to include diagrams and there are diagrams also similar to ascii doc that can be specified or described with text formats and this looks like this then this is mermaid these are um, like activity diagrams from UML and describing these in text has the same advantage as, uh, as said for ASCII doc itself you can easily track them in your version control and it um, make, made it us, for us a lot easier to keep track of those changes and work collaborative on those on those diagrams so this is plant UML, maybe you've heard of that, that's pretty popular. And this is, can all be integrated with, with ASCII doctor and directly rendered to the document, as you can see here. What I found also really useful is um, tables. Tables can also be described in text, like you can see here. And uh, this is um, then each line and then the, the cells. But sometimes, it, especially for a large amount of data, that gets, again, really uncomfortable. And this is why it's useful that we can use directly CSV files here to have the data. And CSV can then be edited with Excel, and then it makes it, it's the first step to make it more usable. Um, it gets even better later, as a, as a teaser now. <laughs> Um, okay, and for the source code, as I have shown, we can, of course, paste the source code in here. But this is, in the end, again, a, a, a point where it might diverge between what's actually in the code and what we have in the documentation. So what ASCII doc also can do, we can include directly from a source file here, like I did here, with the reference to my business.java file. And to not just include the whole file because that would of course blow up most of the times my documentation having my uh, even if it's a small class just 150 lines of code is in the documentation too much so the feature ASCII doc provides here is that I can define in here a key and use that key then in my source code file in a comment and ASCII doc would then pass out and just take the block which is between these comments and take this into the documentation I can show you. So I'm running ASCII doctor here with Gradle. There's a Gradle plugin for it. That's um, pretty usable from my perspective. It's also possible to use it with Maven. So it's one is not limited to one or the other system. Both are possible. Um, and there's no drawback with one or the other from my findings. And most of the times I do use Gradle, but with the colleagues I discuss this or see that uh, they use ASCII doctor and Maven project is the same quality. It's just, so it's really good integrated. So if we open now, um, oops. Docs. file. I see down here that it just included that method content, not the class specification around. So it just took what I, what's between these comments. Yeah. So that's also really useful to, to reference. Okay. Um, on top of that, there is especially for the um, plugins in IntelliJ and and Visual Studio Code, there is a nice feature for drawing diagrams. Maybe you know Draw.io, which just has has renamed to Diagrams.io. If I would include a file here or reference a file here, I hope everyone can see it down, um, which has that .dio in its name, um, that, uh, that that plugin detects that the file is not there, but apparently I want a draw IO diagram. And what I can tell them here now is create the missing file 
and it creates the file and opens in line in my IDE the editor from Draw.io. And so I can now draw here my diagram inside my IDE. So that's really, really nice not to, not to change into another environment. And then if I switch back to my documentation file, I already see down here in the preview they included SVG, SVG and um, then I can include that and have it uh, also as a source included. The, actually, the source that's needed for a draw IO to edit this file is included in the SVG. Ah, we don't. Ah, no, we see it here. It's included in the SVG markup. So this SVG remains editable in on draw IO. So this is really, really useful. So my colleague could then go and extend on the next iteration and improve on that diagram. Yeah, that's that's the joy of ASCII doc. But um, sometimes uh, we wish for more, right? And what might that be? I'll let you know in a second. So that's then what what we've seen is the first step to docs as code. This is really popular or getting more and more popular. This is why I wanted to share our our ways to do it with you. Um, and docs as code is also supported by a project that's called docs doc toolchain. And this is based on Gradle and, and ASCII Doctor, what I showed you, but it's it, it built up a lot more and the community has put up really a lot of nice things. Um, one nice thing is that the doc toolchain integrates with the ARC42 template. Um, if you have not heard of it and you have to document software projects, I can strongly recommend to look into it. It's a template. It's meant to be tailored, but it also has for each paragraph they suggest one should, should do, should document about a project. They have a description what they think should be documented in there. And of course, not uh, every project is different, so throw away what you don't need. But it's, it's nice to have a guideline and, and what to think about, and it's really useful. And maybe if there are multiple projects in the company around, it's useful to have maybe the same template to go for, so everyone um, has a familiar familiar structure to, to go with. Um, I can show you more of that in a minute. First of all, an overview, and this is what the community made of that uh, doc toolchain. So these are uh, contributions of many, many people. And what you see there in the center, this is our documentation. And everything here on the left-hand side are plugins and tasks in the doc, doc toolchain you can use as an input. And these integrations are really, really useful. You can use Jira to get your issues, to get all the information about issues and what's in Jira exported and or use the doc toolchain to import it into your documentation. Use your Git repository. Use some of the enterprise standard formats like Visio, PPTs, Exos, and um, convert them in uh, ASCII doc and then convert them in the end, include them in one consistent documentation. And having them in our documentation is already good, but then, on the other hand, this is also really useful that we can, over here, go not only to, to HTML and PDF or HTML5, we can also export them into Confluence. And this is, this is probably um, as important as creating good documentation, that we take care for providing that documentation to the users or to the, to the people it, it should be used of. Um, yeah, it, it has to be made accessible. If documentation is there and then nobody knows about it or nobody knows where to find it, it's, it's like it's not there. So if we actually want that all the effort we put in the documentation is worth something or helps somebody in the end at some point in time, then we also need to make sure that it it can be found and it is accessible. And this is where, where when something like Confluence is established in the company, um, it's probably the, the, the way 
to make it accessible with the least barriers. So people can, can find it with the search function there, they can browse it without opening another system or something like that. Also, um, also what if conference is not around, then you can publish it as a microsite and then just um, just uh, make the URL of it into a URL or the public URL public known to each to each other. Yeah, that's the overview. And um, let's look at the doc two chain then. One thing I really like about the doc tool chain is that it improves on that table integration. So when we have in, when we have more complex structures we want to or data we need to for some reason put into Excel and this helps in every uh, happens in every company I guess. Um, then it might happen that we get tables which have row spans, call spans, where we have to format things left align, right align, colors as, as uh, status indicators, and stuff like that. And yeah, it's possible to code that in ASCII doc, but it's not as nice as just using Excel. And this is where the doc tool chain comes into play because I can now go and convert this Excel into an ASCII doc. And um, to do that, uh, I asked the history. Export Excel. There's so the doc toolchain while it's running um, is you know, provides also a wrapper script which makes it really easy nowadays to use it. Um, we can we can ask for the tasks. And it's it's using Gradle as I said before to instrument ASCII Doctor, and it also here are the list of tasks which is still pretty small, right? And here you see uh, what what we also already saw in that nice picture. This is the list of, of, of tasks we can do. Here's the export Excel. We see also here export change log where I can integrate uh, Git. And um, uh, also down here publish to Confluence the tasks. So, and um, I've let it run the export Excel task. And that export Excel task scans my um, location which I can configure, in that case it's just the, the project source directory for Excel files, and then it takes every um, sheet in the Excel file and converts it into an ASCII doc file. So it creates a um, directory here, and subdirectory for my Excel file, this is a sample XLX, and then for every sheet uh, a separate file. This is uh, just a second sheet I added for to have it as a demo. And here's the complex table it created. We already see in the preview it looks pretty much similar to what we had in Excel. And um, but you also also see here in the in the generated ASCII doc that doing that by hand might might really get tedious. Um, it's still small. So um, so there are some really uh, special features to be set and it's really much more handy to generate it with doc toolchain. Mm, now integrating that. Make sure that I can put this include task to my my ask it file. This maybe I didn't emphasize earlier enough. Of course you can um, include 
file files and compose a larger document of such uh, uh, a lot sub files so you can put each chapter in a, into a sub file which also makes it easier then again in the merge request um, to see what actually changed in the file <laughs> or in which context so um, now this ran and now we have that table that was in Excel before, we have it here in our ASCII doctor HTML document. And we see the alignments here are, as we had it before, the, the title is bold and everything adopted as we wanted to, to have it. Good. Yeah, also then, um, if you want to. Download template is the task that downloads that ARC42 template and uh, puts it into my documentation directory. So it's um, it's much easier than using the web page to set up a project with this. It's, it, it is available in many languages. Um, so English, German, Italian. Um, and it asks me which one to pick. And here I have the option if I want to have these help sections I, I mentioned have included in the document or not. And so I do with help. <coughs> and now it's installed. Have a look at it. It's placed in my docs directory here in ARC42 subdirectory. And here I have it with all, with all these sub-chapters where I said it's really meant to be tailored. It's not meant to be filled out by, by, uh, for every project. Sometimes it just doesn't need. And um, what you see here is then these are the help boxes. This is what, where they describe what they thought it's, it's useful to have there in the documentation. This helps a lot when, when dealing with the template the first time. So you don't see just the heading, you get an explanation and a, and a guideline what to put in there. No, oh, and um, yeah, of course we can go here and generate PDF, and then it would generate the PDF out of it, which is also nice to send it to customers. So internally, we push, uh, we publish to the conference to have it searchable and accessible. And if a customer asks for documentation, we most of the time just do the generate PDF task and then send that off to the customers. And then it's a nicely rich table of contents and what you might expect. And of course, here we don't have, as in the HTML5, we don't have collapse expand or in, in conference, we have the help boxes. So for the customer documentation, certainly you want to remove these. That's true. Okay, and then about the export to conference uh, task. What does that look like? This is from one of our real projects, um, it's easier to show or maybe also interesting to see that it's actually used. Um, it puts all your subchapters on separate pages, which, which makes it easy to, to browse it and easy to, to um, get to the point on conference. And what's really useful on conference that by default the doc toolchain puts in this comment, this, it says do not, uh, this is a generated page, do not edit. So everyone is all the time reminded that these are generated pages because edits would be lost next time the generation or the export is run, of course. Yeah, here also um, pictures get exported. Uh, this is, of course, something. Have it here. Okay, yeah, the, and then pictures and everything else is uh, attached to the conference page by Doc Toolchain as well. 
yeah, that's uh, that's the doc two chain demo. Let's see what else I have in the slides. Um, to summarize it from my point of view and my experience, what what makes good documentation? So what should we take care for? Um, it's always the balance. As few as possible, as much as needed. It's um, there's also in German there are some phrases which emphasize on it's easy to write a lot of text. It's hard to write short and concise text, and uh, so short text sometimes take more time than a long text. But um, as said earlier, it's of course a lot easier to just write a text and then improve on that than to try to um, write the perfect text in the first edition. That is. Um, it's kind of impossible, I, I think. It's <laughs> um, we should or we need to establish documentation in the team. It's really hard for a single person to be the documentation guy because you always have to fight with the others almost to actually get some meaningful documentation. So we try to establish it in the teams we include it in the definition of done, so the agile processes help a bit because if it's not in the merge request, it's not done. So documentation is part of the merge request. Um, having a doc weekly or a recurring meeting where the team reflects on the state of documentation, where the team is reminded of consume the documentation. If you get to a feature, to an area of the software you haven't been working before, do not just ask your colleague, please consume the documentation and realize what's m what might be missing and then extend the documentation with your findings. Constantly work with it, so eat your own dog food is the phrase which, which is really helpful here. And establish shared ownership. So, as I said, not that guy who is responsible for documentation. The team is as responsible as the document for the documentation as it is for the whole software. Make the documentation part of the software product, software or project result. And then in the end, as I said, visibility and accessibility. Um, documentation that's stashed away somewhere is not of use for anyone. Collect feedback is something that helps realizing that the documentation, that the, the effort put into the documentation is worth it. So we, um, in it, in the team, giving the feedback, okay, that's good, that's not good, I really could use that diagram, could, could work. It helps to uh, to do it the next time, like to much, uh, motivate ourselves. And also after some time, maybe collect uh, feedback from the outside. If you have given the documentation somewhere, ask. People would not give feedback by themselves on documentation. I never had that, basically. <laughs> or, or the worst cases. If documentation is missing or outdated, then people complain about it. That's feedback, yes. But um, or if it's okayish, they don't um, usually talk about it. So we need to ask. We need to collect that feedback. What's next? Um, I like that book a lot. I can recommend it, Living Documentation. Um, they write about that docs as code, and um, they put push that even further. If you have that integration between source code and um, the documentation, being close to your source base, as I described, you can also include these into your automated tests and then include the automated test results again in your documentation. And you, then you have some sort of a life cycle that makes your documentation living. And that it might also be really useful because to that extent, I, I never got the chance so far to actually try that. But the idea is then that you could give the tests or and the software system to a business user who just changes his Excel with the input fields. And so he can play around with the system. He commits that changed Excel on his branch. The CI system lets the tests run, generates also doc without documentation. And so uh, it comes back to the business user in an understandable way. So that's... Um, it's a really, really nice play. I think it needs a, a certain size and willingness in that organization to establish that. Um, another nice project which is similar to Doc Toolchain, but 
focuses on uh, or emphasizes on a different use case. It is also meant to integrate multiple documentation repositories into a documentation site. And then it emphasizes more that you have a checkbox or a select box for the version you want to uh, read about. And you, the URLs you have to that site then includes also the version number. So that really um, emphasizes on that a bit more. And this session is too, too short, unfortunately, to also demo that. So, okay. I hope you found the session worthwhile. Uh, that's me. I'm Markus Schlichting, working at Karakun as a software engineer, architect. We do hacker gardens. If you want to know more about hacker garden, uh, it's hackergarden.net. It's, it's the idea to have an open source contribution community. And um, the idea is meant to be open. So if you want to run a hacker garden by yourself, feel free or contact me and ask. I can certainly give you some tips how to establish it. Or if you want to stop by in Basel, um, Marco Silon is running one in Lucerne. Um, yeah, there are also there are some instances around. Good. Uh, we are Karakun. We develop software um, and enjoy it. So, thank you. Good. Uh, we have time for questions. If, uh, I don't want to block you. <laughs> you are free to leave. But if there are questions, I'm happy. Thank you. Uh, a brief question uh, about the um, the chain, the tool, doc tool chain. Mm -hmm. uh, you show us the transformation between from Excel to ASCII doc uh, to create, well, awesome tables, okay. Um, it could be also reverse from the same table, because uh, my use case is, okay, I create this table, but then I need to maintain it and change it, but I don't want to <laughs> go in the complex code of ASCII doc for that table. That's why I yeah, you started <laughs> from an Excel. So, yeah. so I need to transform it to Excel again and change in Excel and then uh, no, we keep that Excel file. We oh, just okay. re-export it later. We maintain it in Excel and then just okay. generate the documentation from it. Okay. Yeah. So there is no possible to reverse the... It's process. actually possible. It also generates a CSV and you can then... But you lose the format ah, okay. yeah. then. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, what I forget to mention before the next question, I have stickers. If you like that raccoons I had on the slides, um, feel free to stop by or also stop by at, your, at our booth. And uh, if you have later questions, you feel free to contact me. Um, there are some details or at our booth. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Have fun.